Did you move some of your books over to your, uh, over here from your church? Uh, I don't remember those being on the shelf over there. Oh, I, I just got that set. What is that? That's uh, Britannica's Great Books. So it's one of the, there was a series of great books um, attempts, you know, making like a set of great books that, you know, com- put, pulls together all of the uh, different great books in English literature. Or this one has some German literature and some different things in it. But the idea was that, you know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, up until the 50s, was that a great education was available to everyone that had five feet of bookshelf space to fill. You could fit a great education into five feet of bookshelf. And so you've got the Harvard did it, Britannica did it. Um, the Everyman series was the, it began that way. Um, Oxford Classics series, uh, Penguin Loeb Classics, a bunch of different people. It's kind of the that era of the encyclopedia. The encyclopedists um, said, "Let's get a great education together." You only need about you know five feet of bookshelf space to get one. I you know the first time I saw that I was down in uh, Alabama. <clears throat> working on a particular project, uh, film project, and they had this Harvard Harvard um, selection. Yeah. It was like twelve or yeah. fifteen books or something like that. Yeah, it was the red set that one, or the, or was yeah, these, yeah, these might have been reprints, so it okay. might have been the red set. <clears throat> but the the whole idea and concept was, if you read these, you'll have basically a Harvard type education. Yeah, and, yeah. And, I was like, oh, okay, what are these? And like, one of them was the Bible, and another one was like the great books, and it had a list of the great books. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so, where'd I get a copy of those at? Because I haven't read those <laughs> yet. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. That used to be basically what was considered an education was where you were able to follow and enter into the great conversation of human history, right? So um, there's been this great conversation going on since, you know, however, since, since the beginning and uh, the conversation of human history is, uh, is what you're educated into, right? That's why it's called a liberal arts education because your mind is free liberal has the liberty your um to a, be a, be a part of any conversation uh and and i it's why it, it's it's you know liberal arts education was considered the education of a free man um and so that's why guys like booker t washington were were so important because they said oh this is what if this is how this is how free men think right they they are free to enter into any any part of the conversation of humanity um they have a general broad (laughs) knowledge and education and he 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 labored tirelessly (laughs) tirelessly to get tuskegee started so that the slaves that were coming out of physical economic slavery could also come out of this the the slavery of not being able to be a part of the conversation of human history you know, it's so funny. You would think that we would have learned what was the most important thing about keeping slaves slaves. It, well, it was making sure that they couldn't read. Right. Right. And and the people and which was amazing. So the people who were like, yeah, we want to end slavery. You know, what we'll do. We'll teach our slaves to read. Right. Like, that's how we're going to work through this. Like, we're going to. Yeah. And it's amazing. Like now. Everyone like we were talking about last time is illiterate. Yeah. And when yeah. you have an illiterate people, what you have is a people disconnected from the conversation in history. So they've become slaves to whatever. Whatever fad exactly. comes along. Yeah. Yeah. They don't. And I, and, and I think what's so important about it is we, you know, we, we tend to think everything is politics and economics. You know, I, I always mm. joke that NPR, they've got that show, All Things Considered, 
which spends all of its time talking politics and economics, right? Like right. we're going to consider everything important, meaning politics and economics. And so when we talk slavery, we just think politics, we think economics, yep. we don't think slavery of the mind. We don't think spiritual slavery. We, we don't think moral slavery, right? There's th that slavery um, was, the, you know, Paul can say a slave that knows Christ is a free man right? because there's other kinds of slaveries besides simple economic slaveries. Mm -hmm. Now, when you've got freedom of the mind, free, moral freedom, spiritual freedom, uh, freedom, you know, soul freedom, you end up giving <laughs> it, it here's and here's what's interesting. You don't end up just finding freedom for yourself. You end up being the kind of person that gives freedom to others. Right. Create that, a culture of freedom. You, you, you create a culture of freedom. You you start recognizing slaveries for what they are. And you start figuring out ways to to give freedom. And that's the, the principle of the Sabbath isn't you ought to rest. Right. Although that is something it's you ought to give rest. Right. The mm. principle of the Sabbath is that um, you don't own people. Right. That's the that's the that's the fourth commandment. You don't get to own people once a week. You give everyone the day off. Everyone gets the day off because God owns them all. And he's a God who rests on the seventh day. And so you give rest on the seventh day or Jesus recreated the world in three days and rested on Sunday. And so we give rest on Sundays. We take rest too, because God owns us. Um, and, but you just gonna, we are all, you, you ain't gonna just gonna slip that in here. Act like you ain't gonna have to explain that. What you mean? Jesus recreated the world in three days. What you talk about? Well, God, God created the world the six rested on the seventh. Okay. Jesus, Jesus recreated the world and he rested on Sunday, but he recreated the world on the cross, death, resurrection, right? So his rest so that's what that's the point the Hebrews makes. Jesus rested from his labors or his labors. His labors were the recreation of all things or the restoration of all things. He rested on a Sunday, though. That's why the first time you see a church service after the resurrection, it's on the Lord's Day. Right. They the uh, the the principle of us of uh, resting on Saturday, it says, will last so long as the heavens and the earth remain. Well, the heavens and the earth were killed and raised from the dead. And so we live in a new heavens and a new earth, according to Peter and to Isaiah's prophecy, right? That so, so now we, that, so it, we, we gather on Sunday, just like the early church did because Jesus rested on Sunday from his Wait, labors. You, are you seeing the heaven and the earth has passed away? <laughs> yeah. Heavens and earth passed away uh, on the cross, right? The, <laughs> that. Is this another one of those literature you know, things that my dumb behind just didn't get from reading? Because I, I, man, I this this took me completely off guard. I was reading John Owen, um, like the sixteenth volume of his works is, is a series of short essays and sermons, and I'm, I'm there, you know. No, I mean I didn't read all the first seven. <laughs> I didn't. Read, it just it just happens to be the sixteenth volume. I didn't read all fifteen up. To sure, that. sure, it's Jason. the short ones. <laughs> <laughs> I don't in, the volume, that. <laughs> in volume 16 though I, the reason i was there is because it's his short works right and so you're like ooh, fun <laughs> he's got this one about about how the prophecy of the new heavens and the new earth has to do with the resurrection uh, not with the n not with the second coming right now when at, at the second coming there's a there is a completion of the restoration of all things but the beginning of the restoration of all things when we enter into the new heavens and the new earth is actually at the resurrection. That's, that's the inception of the new heavens and the new earth. And so John Owen makes this argument. Um, it, it's, I think it's a sermon that he's preaching when he's preaching through Isaiah. Um, the, and it's a really, I, th I find it really convincing, right? So he, he shows that it can't be something that has to do with the resurrection at the end of all times because at the end of all things, because it talks about people will die at, a, you know, children will die at a hundred, right? Well, he's, you, you can't, there's no more death after the second coming. And so in the new heavens and the new earth, at, um, you, you've, it's gotta be something else. And so his argument, um, you know, is 
is has to do with the the text itself um and then he he says the only the best conclusion is that the inception of the new heavens and the new earth was that the resurrection um and, and that the the old heavens and the old earth had to do with the the Judaic era um and that that closes out um as Jesus takes over so Jesus takes over all the authority in heaven and on earth right so it's a new heavens um and you know we're told he his death cleansed heaven and earth we're told that his death uh re- rearranged every authority structure in the universe right every authority structure in the universe was rearranged um and the whole of creation was recentered on Jesus and so it's no longer um you the the so uh the temple in Jerusalem I mean, all that is no longer the center of God's work right now Jesus and then the and the presence of the spirit that he sends holy spirit that's the center of all that God's doing so that rearrangement um is a new heavens a, you know a new authority structure and then the new earth is the rule is now ruled by Jesus and no longer under the curse of death because the curse is rolled back. So as far as the curse is found, the grace of God will you know, wash up onto that shore and take the curse away, except for the last enemy, death. The, that enemy will be destroyed at the second coming. So people will continue to die until the second coming. And so in first Corinthians 15, <laughs> when he says the last enemy that will be destroyed is death, right? That that's destroyed at the second coming. But, but that's, that's why Owen argues that if the new heavens, and the new earth involve death, it can't be right. The second coming. So it's, a, I mean, it's a really convincing argument that has to do with the details of the text. That's what is amazing about John Owen. I mean, he's been, he's been one of the most influential writers on me even though I haven't landed in exactly the same places on everything as him, he is text, 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 right? He, he takes the public authority of the scriptures as a public literary authority really seriously. And so he's always digging further and further into the text. Um, and then he spends his whole life focused on the Trinity, justification, sanctification and pretty much that's all he ever wants to talk about right is he just wants to talk about the basics and uh because he's talking about the basics so long he ends up talking about everything um, it, so. which, is, which is funny because everybody loves john owen uh in one way or another but no one talks like him because when he talked about sanctification and when he talked about justification all those things had some sort of applicable real world um uh that, that it touched it touched down in reality it touched down yeah. into political stuff it touched down into um relational stuff it touched down in the real world it wasn't just something that was spiritual in one sense or natural you know it, it was it it was natural it was tangible you know right right <clears throat> yeah and he and he it, and one of the reasons is just because he's not a great writer like other people are better writers but he was a great exegete so hit hit for him he was really really good at at digging in and understanding the text but then he wrote really long awkward sentences he um he you know hit his but some of that had to do with the fact that he was on the run from the cops a lot of his life so (laughs) Uh, that'll that'll make you write things a little differently so he didn't he didn't have time to like edit through things you know because um so, uh, but he would, you know, stay up late. He was, he was infamous for, you know, writing by candlelight. Um, and, uh, it, it, so he also, you know, had to, had to write in hiding all, you know, it's those sorts of okay, funny, so. funny things, but yeah, he, he's, he, he, after Jonathan Edwards, he was the second theologian that I ever sort of fell in love with and thought I I, I, and this, so this is back before Amazon, right? I found his works at a used bookstore and I literally, all the money I had was $15. So I put a $15 deposit down on the works of John Owen and I came back once a week 
<laughs> until I had and paid twenty bucks once a week All right. until I had his works paid off at two hundred bucks. And uh and book it, list. It, yeah. <laughs> John Owens works. John Owens works, yeah. They're like three hundred bucks if I remember correctly. Three fifty, yeah. John Owens. Yeah, sixty. But it, it's it's definitely worth it. The he's the second volume is on communion with God and this you know, he he does a really good job of balancing what has traditionally been called the mystical union um with the objective covenantal union so um ex- so i i like to think of it as the experiential union and the legal union um i I made those terms up. I don't know if anybody else uses them, but the experiential union with God has to do with the fact that it's a, it's a relationship, right? We have a growing relationship with God where we pray and he answers prayer and, you know, we, I, and he, we, we hear directly from God, um, you know, experientially in a relational way, uh, personally. And we have, but it, but it's in a legal objective context uh, where it's uh, a covenantal relationship. Yeah. So it's not a so, so often throughout history there's been a a tip tipping back and forth into you know a legal covenantal only relationship or a legal relationship and then a mystical type of experiential relationship. Um, and we feel like we have to choose between the two. And I think Owen, Owen does a good job of balancing the two um, well, you know, so that when he says, yes, God is still actively speaking in the world and you can expect to hear from him. That's why we go to church and listen to sermons, right? It's going to be particularly focused on your, you know, God providentially brings you to a place and the Holy Spirit speaks to you through his mouthpiece which is the pulpit and the preached word of god and but it's still a personal it's still personal communication to you in particular right you can you, a, a pastor can get up and say thus says the lord to you on a sunday morning yeah and and it's it's a real true communication and he doesn't have to n- know everything about the ins and outs of people's lives the holy spirit will press the word of God into the particulars of a person's life and they'll walk away convicted about something in particular, you know, and, um, or encouraged in a very particular place, you know, that, um, there, uh, the, that, that's, a yeah, we don't have to pick between the two, you know, and we can be, and at the end, even in the, you know, just walking down the street, God can sometimes say, you know, communicate something to you that it, he has every right to do that, but he hasn't ever promised to do it. Right. You, so you know, this is, um, but he has, he has promised to speak to you in yeah. the sermon and in the sacraments. And there are places he has promised to meet you and be with you. And he, all he does more than just simply what he's promised, but never less. I've, um, you know, I, I, coming from a charismatic tradition, there are so many things that I threw out. I threw out the baby with the bathwater when I crossed over and when I became more conservative and then became Presbyterian, that what I lost was the personal relationship, <clears throat> right? I lost it, and not in the sense where like, we're not having a relationship anymore, but the reality is that I know him like I know another person. Uh, and because inside of the conservative reform world, that's kind of like, yeah, that's just all feelings and emotions and stuff. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, another person, like I know my wife. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know what I mean? And, and, and we, we, we reject that in so many ways because we can't quantify it the way that we like. But that's not how God has communicated to us in his word. And so what's really helped me out with this is the book from Jay Gresham Machen, believe it or not, surprisingly, on the book on faith, because. I used to look a uh, person. So then it is basically in a relationship right. <laughs> with someone that you can trust them because yeah. you know them. right? <laughs> and the way exactly. that you know yeah. them is through their, through their words and how they communicate. Like, you know, anyone else. Right. 
And one of the things that really hit me was was I used to hear old folks, old country folks who just loved them some Jesus and, and read their Bibles. They might not have had the best exegesis at all, but they used to say things like, baby, I've tried them. Baby, yeah. I know him. Baby, you can trust him. Trust me. They used to say things like that. Right. Because it was true. They did know him. They had cried out to him. They had prayed to him. He had answered their prayer. You know, he had, he's like, I used to hear old folks say, baby, he will be closer to you than any brother, right? They, 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 they where are they getting that from, right? They know where they're getting right. that from. But the, it was something that they really had experienced because of their faith in Christ. And, and whatever, I found that some of those folks, knew the Lord better than some of the high level theologians that we all like to praise because they weren't removing the tangible realities of that relationship, that person to Christ um, and saying, well, if it's, you know, <clears throat> and saying it's this way or in no other way, this is the only way that you can have um, get to know that person. But God's word is living and breathing and active and the Holy spirit quickens it in us in relationship and brings us in closer relationship with Christ through his word. So those two things aren't, you know, this is goes back to um, ontology and <clears throat> economy, right? Like th these things yeah. don't have to be at, at, at war with each other. They can harmonize perfectly if you let them. Anyway, that wasn't even what we were supposed to be talking about, but. Well, but yeah. And that's, that is one of the things that over time your, as your faith grows, it grows because you see God, acting right you see god like you you know that god has acted throughout history you look throughout history and you see that he's acted for his people and that's the psalmist often brings in that argument when he's wrestling with god right he'll say look you have always taken care of your people mm -hmm. i know the stories mm -hmm. right and but then he looks at his own life he says but i don't see you doing it for me right now and so you the the prayer the the prayer is you promise lord you can, you i need you to come through on your promise yeah, right yeah. um and he because he has promised but you over time you see him come through enough times and you start to say you start to sit on the edge of your seat more often and say ooh where is it going to be this time right where is it going to where's where's god going <clears> to <throat> come through i i remember when we were um, working on starting a, a classical school down in California. And um, we had a, uh, a new headmaster, you know, really great guy. And we had uh, our budget all laid out and we set it up and we spent everything prepping the, for the school year for the summer. And we had, we couldn't afford desks. So we um, said, Lord, we need desks. And we get a phone call from the Christian school up the street that says, hey, we're replacing all our desks. You want the old ones? We uh, we 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 got to the uh, and we got to the end and we kept seeing things like that happen over and over. And we get to the end of the summer and the headmaster walks in. And he says, I forgot to buy a printer for myself in the and we're and the budget's gone. Right. The money's gone. And. So I was like, well, what kind of printer do you want? And he was like, well, it'd be nice to have a wireless printer with some with some extra cartridges and maybe color. That'd be good. So, OK, let's pray. You know, Father in heaven, we need a wireless printer with cartridges, extra cartridges and color would be really nice in Jesus name. Amen. And he says, amen. And, and he says, you know, that's not the way it works. Right. <laughs> and we all kind of laugh and. Because we we knew we couldn't get one ourselves. That <laughs> about lunchtime that day, a guy comes walking through the door with a box and says, "Hey, I got a uh, color printer here. It's wireless and it's got some extra cartridges. Does anybody here need that?" <laughs> and he sticks his head out of his office, and I stick my head out of my office, and we both just have a good laugh. Like God just reminds us. Hey, we're listen. I'm listening directly to your prayers, right? And he does that often throughout life. I, my wife was the one that taught me you got to pray specific prayers, or so that you can, because because God's going to answer them, but you won't recognize it unless you're specific enough. And so she's taught me to pray like incredibly specific prayers. Um, oh, and uh, and then you get to see him answer those incredibly specific prayers, and uh, um, 
and sometimes you know you find out oh i wasn't praying for the right thing but you've because <laughs> he gives you something else that was better uh but the sure. uh, or, or or you pray too small you know um but you know, i remember uh, another story of a uh, guy that was he he came in and he was like look i am 362 dollars short for my bills this month and i don't know where it's coming from and so i said well okay all right let's pray let's pray and we'll see what we can do and um figure it out and we prayed for 362 dollars and uh the next day i'm sitting and counseling with somebody else and he comes up to my window and poof, you know puts the check up there it's for 362 dollars and 10 cents <laughs> Why didn't I ask for a thousand dollars? And uh, it was, and enough things like that happen often enough that you start to realize God is present with us, and I just am not paying attention. God is listening much more intently than I am speaking, uh, and yeah, that it changes things. So that's why those you got you got to keep you got to have those older saints in the congregation that know that stuff in their bones. Last night I was talking to Sharon. This is not on the conversation we're supposed to be talking about, uh, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah, we Sorry. Um, but I have to talk about this because I think this is important. <clears throat> I was talking to Sharon and we were talking about trusting God because we were talking about rebuilding society and culture. What do we want to put in our kids? Um, because when you look at Abraham, what Abraham got uh, doesn't seem fair in one sense or another to what the children of Israel got. Right. Right. <clears throat> and and so it's like, but Abraham believed God and trusted God. And then uh, that was counted to him as righteousness. And God said, you're going to have all of this. Right. And Abraham's like, I, I don't even have a place here for yeah. myself. But I believe only, that, Lord. The you only know? thing he ever owns is his tomb. His, That's it. His wife's tomb. Yeah. That's it. You know, and um, and I was telling my wife, I was like, you know, we're at a place right now where we're looking at society and we're looking at culture and we're like, Oh my goodness, this thing is not in a good place. Now we don't have great perspective over history and time. It's been, it's actually in a great place. God has it right where he wants it. But when we look at American culture and we see the lack of faithfulness. We see this, the, the, the erosion of culture that should be there. And we know that this thing isn't where it's supposed to be at. We look at it and say, boy, we have a lot of work to do. Me and you've talked about that. So you, you said 100, 150 years, you know, and, and I took that seriously. And I was like, man, Abraham, I got this from Toby. Abraham believed God and then went and did bomb runs on the land he goes and sets up wells <laughs> and, right. and, and builds these altars and what you end up finding out is that the children of israel at times went and hit all those places and, and worshiped right and and he did bum runs on the land and i was telling my wife i was like you know first corinthians 10 tells us not to be like the children of israel who tempted the lord in the desert so what God is communicating to us there is that there is a connection between faithfulness and faithlessness. And so like, don't be faithless, be like Abraham, trust God and obey. Right. And so if that's true, when we look at the culture, we can look at it with the same sort of um, perspective and worldview, even greater than that of Abraham, because we have so much more of the story than he ever did. And we have, the work of God rolled out in a more massive way than it ever was. And so when we think about the next 150 years, we should say, okay, what does our bum runs look like? So that my children, if I think about it, three or four generations, my great, great, great grandkids, um, we calculated it up. I think it was three or four generations. We should look at 186 of our kids. If each one of them had three, and, and it's like, oh, wow, like in three gen three generations, we can have 186 Shannons running around here. Like, yeah. Oh, OK, hold, hold on a second. So then we start calculating what are the seeds? What are the building blocks? Because I told my wife, I was like, we're not going to make it out of here. <laughs> we're not going <laughs> to we're not going to be the ones like we are right. not going to be the ones we are in Abraham's position in one sense. Right. We're not going to be the ones to get out of this. 
What does it look like for us to throw the seeds and load the seeds on our children's back? And what kind of trees do we want our great, great, great grandkids planting and building culturally, right? And we started calculating what that looked like. And we were like, some of the most valuable things that we can give our kids if we're rebuilding this culture and society so they can build it is knowing the history that they're connected to covenantally, being able to read and have a, a complete form of literature, right? Uh, a, a understanding poetically, like we talk yep. about. Yep. Um, and having faith in God to accomplish that work. Those are the three things that we really wanted to anchor in, inside of our kids so that Whatever comes from that, three generations down, that should be enough to plant and to build and to restore um, a kind of culture that we want to see here in America right now. And, and so that means that the, the responsibility that I have as a father and as a husband, it shifts all of a sudden for me because my responsibility becomes forward looking. Right. Right. You know, forward looking to say, I need to load my kids up with a certain type of faith in God and knowledge and education and wisdom to be able to bring about that type of, of reality in in three, four generations to my grandkids and to my great grandkids and to my great great grandkids. So they look back and say, man, grandma, great great grandma, Shannon and uh, dad and Shannon were phenomenal. Thank God for them. You know, and so we don't know, like you think about, I don't know right now any Christians that I can point back to and say, oh, that's five generations of blessing, right? Right. Like, I'm, I'm, I want to say that, I, I prob but I don't know. I can see three. I can see three. And that three, when I look at them, boy, that's amazing fruit. For yes. Me. Huge right? fruit. Huge fruit. But five? What are we going back? Five, that's what? Pre-civil pre or right around Civil War time? Five generations, if you mark five it like five generations, yeah, but would be civil war. Yeah, it's the civil war generation. <clears throat> it's like if, if imagine if I would have planted this type of fruit for my family back then. Yeah, the situation for the Shannon clan and the people that they would bless would be completely different in the world, right? Yeah, well, I mean, and I'm we we don't even know how to think that way. You know, there was a. I believe it was the um, uh, one of the main buildings on the Oxford campus when they built it in the uh, they they built it and it had a huge giant tree across the top or a log across the top because it was a free span. And that was what it took to make a free span building back then. And um, but after 500 years, it was starting to rot and they thought oh man what are we gonna do uh, it's too big of a log we're not gonna be able to replace it so they were they hired an engineer to come in and figure out how to build something new in order to to save the roof and so he got out the original plans right which were 500 years old <laughs> and what it said it had a it had an arrow pointing to a particular tree that said, when this one rots, we've planted a tree right here that will be ready to replace it. And so they go out into this, into the woods and they find the tree and it's still there and it's exactly the right size of what they need. And so what they end up doing was taking that tree and replacing the tree. So they had thought 500 oh. years in advance, the engineer oh. had, right? We don't, we don't think like that. It's not on our, we don't think historically, so we don't think future futuristically or future we're not a future oriented people and so we don't prep for 500 years from now um, but we need to start right and you know we 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 don't want to despise the day of small beginnings uh we want to think okay how do i what seeds do i plant now that in 500 years will be the the giant tree that we need um so yeah i love the way that they used to think of the middle ages, <laughs> you know, but that's, that's part of what we're trying to resurrect. You know, I called you this week because they had a hit piece on Tucker Carlson from the New York times that came out and we had just been talking about offices and it was clear to me that the attack on Tucker Carlson was really attacked to get to the people that he's, he's kind of a go between for 
it was obvious that that was the case because you don't come after a target. The left is very smart. Le the, the Republicans and conservatives usually go after weak points. <clears throat> the left is smart. They go after strong points. And the reason that right. you go after strong points is because there's no defense for it. It's a strength. You don't defend your strengths, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so they know since there's no defense, they can just throw haymakers out there and maybe they'll get lucky and knock it down. <clears throat> and so when knowing that I saw them go after Tucker, I'm like, oh, they want the people. And since we were talking about offices, I was like, man, is is journalism an office? It has to be an office because I know that you got father, you got mother, you got pastor, you got um, deacon. You know, you there's offices in society. You have civil magistrate. And and so I was like, man, I call, I hit you up. I was like, hey, man, is like Tucker Carlson, is that a, is, is, is journalism an office of some sort? And you were like, no, it's an estate. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm sorry. Press pause. What? <laughs> and listen, we hadn't got to that part yet. What kind of estate? Does it have 10 bedrooms and four baths? Is it on 700 acres? Or what, what, I don't, what do you mean estate? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, and you were like, why haven't we talked about this? And yeah, I said, and, yes. <laughs> and I said, I, I put Edmund Burke on the list and I and said we need to get into conversation with Edmund Burke. He's the one that termed journalists the fourth estate um and or the press. So the reason we have freedom of the press is because of a man named Edmund Burke who argued that the fourth estate of society was the media or the press whose job it was to uh tell the truth. Right. So that they're, they have one simple job, tell the truth. And that way, the other three estates um, know how to will be able to keep one another in check. So the checks and balances of the social order are are uh, are driven by journalists. They don't they aren't the ones that necessarily do the checking and the balancing and the keeping in balance, keeping uh, keeping a check on one another. But they're the ones that their job is to tell the truth to the other estates about each estate. Um, and then that is the one that is how the estates then keep each other. There's a, there are social checks and balances. So there's governmental checks and balances. And then there are social checks and balances. Mm. And the and fourth then... estate is the journalists. And then you went on to say, well, wait, what are the other three estates? Right, that said, was a question. That's why we got to, that's yeah. why we got to talk about Chaucer. <laughs> Which is like, okay, so we got Edmund Burke and then we got Chaucer and I was like, okay, <clears throat> because, okay, what are the, so then let's probably work through this easiest. What are the other three estates? Because it seems like that when I think about public checks and balances, I think that some of these other estates work both for the public as well as for and not just the press right yeah so so the 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 estates um this and this is just this is straight down the middle medieval social theory um so pre marxist social theory and we don't know how we think in terms of classes um and in terms of class rivalry and whether we are um, conservatives, Republicans, Democrats, uh, liberals, everybody post um, po post you know Western Marxist revolution thinks in terms of classes and class warfare, class rivalry. What year is and, that? Like, give me a year. So eighteen uh, nineteen nineteen eighteen forty nine nineteen seventeen. That was the the era of the uh, of the <clears throat> class class uprising class rivalry and it's um a, and there's a re you know there's a reason for that there was uh it, it which we can get to but it, the medieval understanding of society was that you had um three estates within society you had nobility you had clergy and you had um, and you had the commoner, right? The common man, right? And so the um, the common man it it was made up of peasants and merchants and skilled laborers, um, 
the nobility, they uh, they ruled and guarded, right? So that was their the the nobility were the knights, uh, the mm. the knights, the nobles, and the royalty, right? So they uh, ruled and they they gardened. So they they um, it was their job to make sure that the land was set up in such a way that it could flourish because it was both protected and provided for. And then the land provided for the people, right? So they, they didn't provide for the people directly. The land did that. Right? So uh, the, and their job was to protect it and make sure that it had what it needed. And then um, so the, uh, so they, they had the political power as well as the, uh, the sword, the, the force. So they, the police were part of the uh, that estate, as um, as well as soldiers were part of that estate. And, and lawyers, it wasn't, but lawyers are too, and judges, uh, right? With, and, and lawyers, judges, um, nobility of any sort. We don't really have nobility in America, but uh, yeah. in throughout Europe at the time, they had nobles, and then the and then the royalty, which would be sort of the executive executive governing branch. Okay. Um, as well. And then, uh, and then the clergy, um, was a much more, there, there were a lot different kind, more, a lot more kinds of clergy in the middle ages than we have now. You know, you've got everything from the archbishop, the bishop, the Pope, the archbishop, the, and the bishops who had more of a, a, a ruling that if there was more of a rule, um, that they did. And then you had the priests and the monks who did the, uh, the praying, right? So right. they, they were the, and then you had people like sextons who were, um, they were, they were a praying order, but they were more of a blue collar play praying order. They took care of the church's land and property and, but they, uh, Deacons. The, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so they, um, and then, but you also had uh, females uh, in there as well. So you had abbotesses who had that ruling role. You had um, nuns who had that praying role, that praying and service role. Um, so you had a lot more um, options within the clergy. And the clergy made up about 10% of Europe in the Middle Ages, the ruling class made up about 2% and then everyone else was a commoner. And those were the three estates. Uh, and they said that it, that it, that, um, that, that culture will always nat by, by its nature, people will organize themselves into those categories, into those people groups. Um, because it, there is, uh, because that's the nature of, people that's you know as they reflect the image of god there's different things about them and different people are going to have different strengths and over generations people are sorted into one particular estate or another um and that and that that is natural and in not natural in a metaphysical sense it's according to nature right uh that that different people have different strengths and so they'll end up in different places and when we um when we embrace that we actually will find our place in an integrated social order <sighs> right so it's so different than the way we think because it's not a power based system it's not a it's not a system that is developed based on grasping after power. It's a system that is intended it, now because of sin, there ends up being power grabbing. There ends up being, and, and they, and there is room within it for what's called the social contest, right? That there is a competitiveness that sometimes brings blessings, sometimes causes problems, but there's a competitiveness within the social, within society that um, they talk about all the time. They, they're not unaware of the fact that there are rivalries that they're, but they just say that actually isn't the defining factor of society, right? That's just part of, sometimes it's part of sin, but sometimes that competitiveness is just 
part of the drive that we have, part of who we are. And um, some people are more competitive than others. And But when you find the place in society into which you fit, and the expectation is everyone's going to have a place in society that is fitting for their strengths. Um, and uh, when you can find that, then you'll find uh, that the, there's a, you know, there's a, uh, uh, well, I, I mean, we don't even really have a word for it, but you just find a happ- happily happiness, you know, joy by accepting um, your place as a gift, right? Accepting mm-hmm. the place that you fit as a gift. So we even think, even when you say, he accepted his place in society. We think, oh, that poor guy, right? We that's he settled. such a tragedy. He <laughs> settled, right? But if you fit, if you're a round hole and you, and or if you're a round peg and you find a round hole and you settle into it, then you're settling. But it's a blessing, right? So <clears throat> finding a uh, that that ambition, um, that ambition. And a fitting place in society can go together. So, Jason, um, th- there's a few things though that when you, in order for that to, in order for uh, the reason that we say, hey, you know, he he found his place in society, oh, and we're, we're sad about that is because the way that we think now is you don't fit inside a society, right? You you need in some way some sort of new information to help you remake society so that it fits around you, right? Yeah. And so we don't right. have that sort of context, but Burke, Edmund Burke is that. And so he, he brings in this fourth estate. Yeah. So he, so he says then there, there's a fourth estate um, because the, um, because of that social contest that there are times that rivalries set in or that somebody's not doing the, the role that is the job of their station in society, right? So if you've got some, a knight, um, and instead of protecting people, he, you know, and so this, there's, there's a whole Arthurian tales about this, um, uh, King Arthur and his, and his Knights of the Round Table. Um, if you've got some knight that instead of protecting a place, he is holding everyone hostage and, um, has gone off has gone off from his duty then it's the job of the um it's the job of the of the fourth estate to let everybody know right so it's the job of the media it's the job of the press to let everybody know hey this person over here is not doing what they're supposed to be doing so that they can actually be returned e- either removed or returned to their proper to, to the to their proper job by the the by force right now whether it's social force physical force economic force whatever it is that that's the job of the press is to keep everyone informed uh, so that the that there are social checks and balances um, as well so the so that the estates of society, remain doing their job and and you know even in the middle ages um it wasn't it wasn't like there wasn't social mobility right it just wasn't um it wasn't from one estate to the other i mean you could become clergy it's a multi-year process of becoming a monk and taking vows and then sealing those vows finally vows of poverty and so and and that's one of the things that this does is having a one of the estates whose job it is to not be to not care about economic mobility was a way of keeping the society as a whole um, in order so that economics didn't get out of its particular place right Right. economics was something but it wasn't the whole of everything and the the fact that you have an entire estate within society that is not economically motivated is there to keep the economics um, from becoming, you know, the the most important or the defining thing. But whereas that's Marxism, right? Is that economics is what defines um, our place in society? And there's an entire estate whose job it is to not care about economics. Mm. Right? To, 
and, and that that keeps the society ba- well balanced. That keeps um, the the uh, desire for economic mobility well balanced because it doesn't change your um, it doesn't it doesn't change you ontologically to make more money. Um, and that and that is constantly visibly shown to you by the fact that the you the church in theory, and this is what goes wrong in the high middle ages, but in theory, the church is supposed to not care about money. It's also what's going wrong in our day, I think. Yeah, but, it's not, absolutely. Yeah. The major, so then, so Chaucer, somehow you said, well, this is why Chaucer is so important. I'm like, well, Edmund Burke seems to be extremely important because of <laughs> this. How does Chaucer then fit into this conversation with Burke? Yeah. So, well, so Chaucer, he's basically, um, in terms of, the influence as a literary um just as a writer of literature he's he's historically been second only to shakespeare in terms of his influence and the genius that he has and um but what he does is he is the first one that writes um stories in which the different estates are are all represented and all in conversation with one another right so um, the Canterbury Tales is kind of his magnum opus. It's and it's the story of a, a, a group of people all from different uh, different walks of life, different estates, all traveling together to Canterbury um, f- to make a, a religious pilgrimage. They're they're traveling together to Canterbury and they get into a storytelling contest um, and whoever wins the storytelling contest, gets a free meal at the inn when they get there. Everybody will pay for them to have a, a really nice meal when they get there. And they have, but he has every person from every state or people from all different estates all tell stories to one another. And they tell stories um, from their own understanding, from their own perspective. Uh, and he creates real people from each um from each estate and lets them speak and tell stories to one another and he shows what does it look like for the three estates to be a part of this social contest together but all be you know well some of them are bad at their particular jobs or bad at their estates you've got clergy that are good you've got clergy that are bad you've got clergy that are swindlers and you've got honest clergy um you've got uh uh nobility um that is kind of silly and self-centered and then you've got nobility that is very noble right you've got a a knight that tells a very noble story and he's a very noble man and then you've got commoners that are also all over the place you've got uh, good commoners and then you've got kind of the filthy minded commoners right so you've got every kind of story you've got sermons you've got poems you've got uh religious uh kind of uplifting stories you've got dirty stories about kind of dirty old men taking taking advantage of women you've got one extended multi-page fart joke that's real <laughs> it's really funny <laughs> you know that one of the clergymen tells um <laughs> that it's don't like spoil it for me yeah i, I don't want to spoil that. it for you right so I mean, it's everything right so it's he he and um so he gives you the whole swath of society all all there in conversation and shows what it would look like for or what it does look like for um good and bad people um all a part of the same society to exist without uh without there there is social rivalry but there is not social upheaval but he's he lives right at the end of that right because what ends up happening was is that um the a combination of ethics and immorality amongst the royalty and the nobility um ends up overthrowing the social order so that by the time you get to um, the communist revolutions, most of the social order has been gutted of its 
effectiveness or a gutted has been shifted and changed. Um, and, uh, and so you've got somebody like Burke, who's the, he's considered the father, sometimes a grandfather of conservatism because he argues there is actually a natural order, right? That by nature, people organize, will organize themselves into this, these kinds of estates, right? That, that, and that, and that to fight against it is to fight against nature, to fight against reality, right? Um, whereas the, the Hegelians, the people following Hegel, like Marx and Engels and, and um, eventually Lenin and uh, what they end up, they start revolutions because they say, actually, with enough gathered power, you can change reality. We don't have to conform to reality. We can conform reality to what we want, or we can conform reality to our ideal. And what Burke says and what Chaucer argues is that we don't conform reality to our ideal. We conform ourselves to reality, and that's how you find a fitting, integrated society, is when we conform ourselves to reality. Um, and Chaucer, he is, um, he just does it by storytelling. His arguments are all story. He just tells stories. Um, and that's his, and he has been more effective. I mean, until 30 years ago, you were considered, you, you weren't really considered educated unless you were conversant with Chaucer. <laughs> now he's just completely disappeared, right? I mean, yeah. He's completely disappeared from the conversation, um, you know, and everything, you know, the early feminists, part of their argument was we was we're extending Chaucer's thought, right? Because he puts women into his stories that act like women, right? That 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 and that they have a place and they enter into conversation with men and he's got he's got foolish women, but he's also got well-educated women. And he's in his, in his stories, he's got high minded women uh, with high morality. And he's got um, women that are immoral and, and rivalrous. And, uh, but, but he's the first one to really introduce women characters. I mean, he's the first one really to introduce what we think of as characters, sort of the way a novel has a character, mm. right? That's a very yeah. individualized character. Um, but he's got men and women both doing that. You've got a few novels in in Rome, in Roman literature. You've got a few novel-like things, but they're all stories about men, right? And Chaucer looks around and he adds women characters because, you know, Christianity is now transformed the way everything is viewed and women as individuals are expected to be a part of not just educated conversation, but, but a part of what it looks like to have a healthy society all in conversation. You're going to have women there yeah. and have them a part of the conversation. And that kind of, you know, goes away when you get to the enlightenment, um, you know, women are regulated out, back out of society by a new ideology or an attempt to return to the ancient, ancient, uh, understanding, but uh, in the Middle Ages, you've got powerful, rich women, well-educated women. You know, an, an abbotess is a is a powerful person, and her power, but her power is uh, all based on um, that she is the the leader of the hospitality for a town. You know, she's like mm. she's she is that, and so her power is her her social power is drawn from her ability to uh is drawn from her strength strength in hospitality but it's a real social power right she's going to be well educated she's going to be conversant she's going to be approached for wisdom um you know kings travel from all over to to meet with certain abbotesses to get advice um but the strength is actually it grows out of her femininity right it's not a it's and that's something that um, as the as the Middle Ages progress, women um, w women enter into 
uh, positions of power in society because there's other strengths besides force um, and the, that are right. recognized. Well, yeah. And, and he's, it sounds like that he's her authority and her uh, ability to operate is rooted in the metaphysical realities of her nature. Right. So, right. Exactly. Yeah. And so, so help me with something real quick, because part of what I was trying to work through was offices versus estates. Um, it seems like some of these kind of overlap or bump into each other, but do they, or, or what's the difference or do we still have estates now or how does that? Well, so I'm, I'm, how does it work we, with the understanding of what an office is? Cause we were just talking about. The- yeah. So I, I'm with Burke on, on this in that I think that they're inescapable, right? It's an inescapable concept. Reality um, is, is, can't be changed. So you're going to have these estates, no matter what, no matter where, no matter what people group, no matter their descendancy, no matter their ethnic, um, ethnic heritage, you're going to end up with these estates, right? You're going to end up with uh, nobility, you're going to end up with commoners, and you're going to end up, and we even think of commoners as an insult, but it's, it's not, it's, it doesn't have to do with um, it, it just has to do with function in society. Um, I was talking to you the other day. I was like, I wish we had a better word for it. We, we general tried to population. come up. <laughs> yeah. General population. Right. Cause now we think in terms of voting blocks, right? So you got general population. Um, and then you've got, uh, and, uh, and then you've got people that rule what hap- what, but there is, um, so offices, have to do with authority, right? Authority and responsibility. Uh, and it, you're, if you're, you're in an office, you're, if you hold an office, then you are wearing that authority and that responsibility. Yeah. Um, the, the estates have to, um, s- some of the offices fall into particular estates, but you can be a part of an estate without holding an office. That instead, so um, if you are a a knight, wasn't an office, right? A knight had to do with particular training that you had and a particular role that you had, um, but it wasn't an office that you held. So just similar to um, soldier, right? If if you are if you are a general in the army, you don't hold an office in God's in the sense of um, in the sense of a God ordained office, right? You, you hold instead an office within an estate or you hold a position within an estate and somebody that is a general who's in that first estate is somebody that should be getting honor for what they do. And they should be, you know, on the receiving end of, of, of our honor and receiving glory and the things that are due to them, but it's a social honor. It's not a, it's not a technical covenantal honor. Cause it's not, he's not a covenant head. Um, he, he, but he is a, the leader within a social estate. Um, and then within a particular army, right? So I don't have to salute a general if I'm not, one of his soldiers, his soldier does have to, but socially speaking, I ought to still give honor to him as a member of that, of the first estate whose job it is to protect my land, my livelihood, my freedom. Right. So, uh, and this is something that medievals just thought deeper about these things than we do because they were more educated than us. Honestly, they had, they, they, uh, they valued education in a way that we don't. So we flatten everything. And some of this is just because of our, the metaphysical assumptions we bring, we flatten everything and we don't want to give honor. We don't want to give glory because it's inescapable. Somebody still will rise to the top. If we take out the understanding of estates and, and merit and, the, the reality uh, of it all, you don't end up with nobody at the top. 
right? You end up with Stalin at the top because he is the most ruthless, right? He's willing to murder everyone that was above him to get there. And so you end up with somebody at the top, no matter what, it's just, is he, is the person there because of, uh, of, of simple power of coercive power, or are they there because they have the giftings to be there? And the understanding that the medievals and that Burke had is that over the course of generations, if people have the freedom that, um, if there is, if there's freedom in it, for there to be a meritocracy over the course of generations, the, the right people will rise to the top in a, in a, amongst the moral people, the right people will rise to the top and the, and the right people will uh, rise to the other positions um, that there are within society. But we don't have freedom or the moral people anymore. So, so would you would you say? <laughs> so would you say that what Chaucer is ultimately doing is trying to help people figure out what these um, would it be fair to call what these um, call them estates? Yeah. What, how, what, to how to live well in the estate that you find yourself in. And so what he's doing is he's telling stories and say, hey, here's here's the order of things and you fit somewhere in here. Mm -hmm. right? right. That they, Well, that's just the assumption that there's a fitting place for every single person. Right. Every single person, there's a fitting state and that there's honor in in, in embracing your place in society and uh, and doing it well. Right. So. And he he lives in a really interesting time where, so he he um, was the son of a merchant, son and grandson of a merchant who actually ends up a, he, raising in society to a place um, above his estate through his skill, right? So he ends up becoming um, a really powerful, not not in the sense of you know getting to do. It, of getting to tell others what to do, but in the sense of being able to do the things that he wants to do. He's a wine wine merchant who then becomes a wool merchant and who then becomes the head of uh, wool imports and exports for England. Uh, and this is a time when wool is is the uh, the main import and export, right? So um, so it's a really really important job and but he's also a poet so he he writes quite a bit and he's sent on secret missions for uh the king he's he and and so he's traveling around on the king's dime um to be able to grow the import and export of of english wool but also um he's delivering sealed messages and uh he's going in doing secret deals for the king, um, it, it, which we don't even know what they all are. We just know sometimes Chaucer is sent with a secret message. And, um, but while he's in Italy, he comes across uh, Petrarch and Boccaccio, who are a couple of Renaissance poets, so the next generation after Dante, as well as coming in contact with Dante's works. Um, he brings the first copy of Dante back to England with him, and that that's how Dante is introduced uh, into England. And then he, uh, as well as the sonnet, he brings the sonnet with him, and and so he begins writing um, in these the, these Italian styles, as well as some French styles that he comes across. He's he's as he travels around, he discovers the poetry of the continent, of the southern part of the continent. And he says, well, this is wonderful. And so he introduces the what's what we think of as the Renaissance. He introduces it into England. And so there's sort of an English literary rena Renaissance that flowers from him. So that that really reaches its peak in Milton, John Milton. Um, and the uh, but so what he does is he says um, there is this there's this movement, this poetic movement going on, and he doesn't want the English to be left out of it. And there's a couple of really important things that, ha that, it, that he brings with him. And it's the idea uh, of translating into English 
So he, it's very likely that he was familiar with Wycliffe. Um, Wycliffe and he are contemporaries. Wycliffe doesn't get in trouble until later, but his arguments for the importance of English translation, uh, wanting the wanting the sources the e- sources in English for the population, are the same arguments Wycliffe gives for translating the Bible. Right, that it's a what's called Christian humanism is flowering. That mm. that that education um, that humans benefit from being a part of an educated society and that that the capacity of everyone to be educated is there um at whether you're no matter which estate you're in the mm. capacity for education is there and so that's a a major thing that that Chaucer uh, influences um as well as Wycliffe so Wycliffe is translating the bible um and and the the translation so the printing press hasn't been invented yet so it's all hand copied versions that are being passed out of Chaucer, but also of the Bible. And it's very likely that Chaucer is convinced by Wycliffe's argument is probably reading the Bible in English at the time, although he's a great Latin scholar. So he would have been reading um, the Latin Bible up till then because he's got a deep knowledge of the scriptures. But he argues that everybody should have access in their own language to uh, the Bible and the great works of literature, right? And um, so, uh, so there's this r- really important seed. The seeds of Protestantism are are planted by Chaucer's travels, right? He sees widely what's going on. He sees Italy, where they um, where they're translating all of the great works into Italian. They're writing poetry in Italian. They're publishing poetry in Italian, and and um, the, as the, those translation works are going on, he sees it in France. He comes back to England and he says, we got to get to work translating the things into English. So the and that's central to the seat. That's a central, important argument in Protestantism. And it, and it ends up um, that that argument ends up in King James's court eventually in the King James Bible being officially OK to be sent around, which is mostly the Coverdale Bible and the Tyndale Bible, you know, are kind of the King James Bible takes parts of other translations that are already there. Um, but that, that argument begins in Chaucer's day. So there's a lot of historical important things that are going on. Um, but one of the really important things is you've got all of these folks that are getting really wealthy on the trade, the, there's um, some new and important farming technology that is either brought to England or invented in England at this time. And so you've got farmers, plowmen, especially getting really, really wealthy. And um, there's this economic mobility that is happening. And Chaucer um, is making that sort of conservative argument that the economic mobility um, as big of a blessing it is it as it is, uh, doesn't change the nature of mankind and the way we organize mm. uh, ourselves according to according to reality, right? So, um, it, it, but he does he does it through storytelling, through poetry. He writes quite a bit of poetry, and most of his stories are in a poetic form of some sort, but they're not poems the way we think of poems. Their stories. He's a storyteller. Um, they just write in write things poetically back then. So man, yeah, it's, it's, it's really weird working through. You know, I was reading through Chaucer, and I was reading through these. He's going through nobility. He's going through the 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 night sun. You know, um, and <clears throat> one of the things that I have to work out of my my mind as I'm reading things is like, okay, reading, reading Chaucer, reading poetry is good. It's might even be better for me than reading a systematic theology. <laughs> right. Because I'm thinking, Oh, I could be reading something that has so much more theological girth to it than reading Chaucer right now. You know what I mean? And, and yeah. so there's this uh, conflict where it's like, I should be reading something else, but 
part of part of what I've realized though in reading um guys like Chaucer and reading more <clears throat> more literature is that they're trying their very best to promote human flourishing. Mm -hmm. You know, and and what poetry is doing is trying to hold up multiple things at a time so that we can see our own selves very well in the society we're in, right? So <clears throat> It, it's 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 a challenge. It's a challenge for me because I'm thinking, man, I could just be reading something else so much better, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Well, I but I think that there's what what happens is, um, we want to we want to we think that truth is scientific, right? And so that the important thing is getting. And this is how this is the point of systematic theology, and it's it's useful. It's got its place, but the point is to never say more than one thing at a time, right? And so, scientific language was developed so that you could communicate uh, about scientific knowledge or uh, about the the knowledge of physical things in the present, um, in order to predict things in the future that you could physical things that you scientifically study that. And they had to develop a language that could communicate from one scientist to the next, what happens in my scientific experiment. And the whole point of a scientific experiment is to take away as many, um, as many, uh, variables. things that variables as possible and get down yeah. to just testing a single thing and systematic theology the language of systematic theology is borrowed from the scientific method in order to uh, to to do the same thing with theology. And it has mm -hmm. its place and it's there's an important place for that kind of argument. But most wisdom has to do with understanding multiple things and their relationship right? Multiple things and seeing their relationship. And that's what poetry does well and stories do well, uh, is, is exercising our ability to hold things together, exercising our ability to look at two things at once, exercising our ability to compare and see which things are the, are, are the same and which things are different so that we can cast ourselves properly into a particular moment and know what story we're in, right? Do, am I, are, are we currently in an Exodus type of story? Or are we in a Joshua type of story, right? Are we, do right. we need to get, do we need to get out of this place? Do we need to go into this place? Right. <laughs> right. You're, you're standing at the Jordan river on both of them. Right? right. You're standing it. But which way should we go? Well, that's a matter of saying, OK, let's compare the two stories to us. Where are the similarities? Where are the differences? That's a wisdom issue, but it's a poetic wisdom issue. Right. And and it's not solved by saying get rid of as many var variables as possible and talk about a single thing. It's solved by being able to make accurate comparisons with uh, multiple things, right? With multiple things in order to have that wisdom. And that's that's what Chaucer uh, does well. Shakespeare does this really well. Great poets do this well. Uh, OK, uh, so let me so then let's let me put this in in the context in which we were talking earlier. I told you that when I was talking to my wife last night, I told her, baby, we're not going to get out of this one. Right. Like, I'm, And so I, in order to be able to make that decision, I have to be able to look at the story we're currently in to observe that situation and say, oh my goodness, this is like Abraham. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I have to be able to do that. So you have to have, you also have to have lots of stories in your soul. That's right. To right? be able to the, read the that. stories over here in your soul, to be able to say, here's this story where, which story is the comparative story so that I can know how this story goes so that I can make the right decision in this moment, because I know where this, a story like this goes. Jeffrey Chaucer, right? Jo yeah. Jeffrey, 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 um, Jeffrey. Jeffrey. So, thinking about that hundred and fifty year plan, two hundred year plan, um, where does Chaucer fit in there as a seed for building culture and society 
that I want to have for my kids. Because, you know, you, you told me the other day, he's like, Chaucer isn't even inside of literature anymore. Like, that's, yeah, we don't read Chaucer. Um, right. And then Shakespeare is fading away. Every other year, I think they might teach Shakespeare. So those, the literature that shapes and makes us in society um, is leaving, which is obvious, but we don't know what's going on, right? And so what's basically leaving is a different form of storytelling has taken over. Right. A different form of narrative. And and we should all know this. If you I was talking to Jason Whitlock today and I had said the reason that the history is such an important issue for black people, particularly, is because whoever is telling the story gets to shape the future. Yep. Whoever can communicate the narrative, if they always want you to believe that you are always a slave, then guess what you will always ever be. Right. right. And so they get to shape the future out of that. And so. Um, 1619 Project isn't uh, doing what we think they're doing. What they're doing is basically trying to tell a story to be able to shape the future so that they can tell you this is the type of categories that you that only exist in society, right? You, you only have slave yeah, they're, master they're and they're slave. Trying to, they're, what they're trying to do is say... Here, let me give you the book of Genesis. 1619 is where it begins. Right, exactly. In the, in the beginning, you were slaves. Right. Yeah, in the beginning, master now, had you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the beginning, <coughs> you you were floating on a boat and you were slaves. Right. Now, um, that, who whoever gets to define the Genesis moment get, is the one giving you your identity. Right. The the one who says here, let me tell you the because yeah. book of book of Genesis is an identity giver. Right. Yeah, it, it, and so that, whoever's it, telling you who the which the which is the book of Genesis, that's the this is the book of Genesis, that's the book of Genesis, that's the book of Genesis, is the one giving you right you you your identity. Um and that's the that's the dangers of something like the 1619 project, especially for uh the black community, right? Because they don't get they're they're not being told. Well, here, wh where'd you come from? Well, you started in the Garden of Eden, with um, with no sin, with with perfect harmony, perfect unity, you know, all of those things, and then even the history of Africa that had you know the some of the largest, greatest libraries in the ancient world that was that had some of the greatest mathematicians and scholars that the world has ever seen. Um, wow, that that were coming out of Africa some of the, the uh, so you you've got this history of Africa that uh, especially before Islam really came in and gutted it um of this incredibly uh educated book book writing book reading people um library building people society uh, that that just um was destroyed by the slave trade but especially just by the Islamic the misuse of the African continent. Um, and then the Europeans taking willingly taking part in that just uh, gutting of, of the natural, re the, both the people resources and the natural resources of the continent. So, but the Genesis story of the African people is remember back before slavery, when we were some of the greatest scholars of the world, remember back when we were some of the greatest uh, the writers and librarians and scientists and uh, and uh, poets of the ancient world. Right? You don't hear that story. No, you you no. hear 1619, the first black people show up on the American shores in chains. We're slaves. Yeah, we're slaves. So. Right. So and um. And it's an it's an attempt to, I think, steal the identity of the black community um, and in order to use them as a voting block, use them for their your own for their own power. Um, so then rebuilding that, because that's 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 the thing when you look at the when you look at the ruins right now, you can't help but see black culture completely in ruin, like it's in ruins. And so we're building that. I'm looking at that. I'm looking at the next 150 years. How does putting Chaucer 
into the backpack of one of my kids, right? You know, yeah. um, I, I tell my wife, like, we are loading our kids up, which is we're out here in, in this part of the country right now because I am trying to find the best seeds that I could possibly find to load up my next generation. And I, I, I made that decision five years ago. I was like, okay, we, we were here for two and a half years. And I'm like, okay, I got to figure out how to replant what I see God blessing. Right. Yeah. And this is where I see God blessing right now. How do I replant that? And so what what kind of maybe this is the thing, what kind of tree does Chaucer create ultimately? You yeah. Know? So re remember we when we talked about identity, we talked about revel in Revelation, every nation, yeah. tribe, people. Well, one of the ways God divides us up is language every tongue right so yeah. it says that's that that one of our central identities is the language that we speak right that and that language forms us into a group right so english speakers is a language group mm. and that and it's a real thing right and so um the so you and your kids and me and my kids are we're all a part of the conversation of the english speaking people throughout history Right. And we can either be people that uh, lead the conversation. Uh, we can be people that leave the conversation or we can be people that are led in the conversation. If you don't know the history of your own language, you will not be one of the people that leads the conversation. Mm. You'll be one of the people that either is led in the conversation or you leave the conversation. Right. So this is this is one of the re things that I've been fighting within my, I mean, I, I tend to hang out in reformed evangelical types of circles, conservative types of circles. And I've been arguing for 25 years in that setting, quit ignoring rap music. Mm. Right. And, and people are like, but it's terrible. It's like, well, first off, that just shows that you know nothing, right? So, <laughs> so, so, but the the reality is that is the place where the poetic conversation of the English language is moving forward, right? Mm. Now, it has been just like other times when you've got a popular form of poetry, it's been monetized and diluted, uh, and I don't, I mean, I don't, I'm, I don't want to be one of those people that was like the hip hop in my day was so much better. Like that uncle that's always like Van Halen's the best band ever. Nothing, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, but there has been a lot of degrading of hip hop over uh, uh, the, the last, but that's just like literature though. Years. Yeah, that's just totally. Like literature. totally. Everything's like being it. degraded and, it, and yeah. it's it, right. It, but the reality is it is the, it is moving the poetic conversation forward. The English language the, the poetic conversation of the English speakers, that's where the energy is. And we will never keep our boys in the faith if we keep them, if, if we have no poetry, right? Because especially young men, they are built to resonate with poetry. And we've been losing 80% of our kids in the evangelical church, according to some stats, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, the, and I think one of the central reasons is because we've got all these boys that are built to resonate with poetry and we give them schlock, right? We give them terrible repetition of three lines over and over and over. Um, we, we bad poetry, uh, and sometimes the music's fine and sometimes the music's bad, but the poetry is always bad. And, uh, and so, and, and then they hear, they they hear hip hop on the radio and the poetry makes their bones tingle and they say i was built for that right i was built for some, i wasn't I, th that thing resonates with the reality of who i am um and we we lose them i remember when dre dropped chronic i i remember the every single boy on my block, right? Let's see. I was ninth grade. Every, every single, we it changed the way they dressed in two weeks, right? Mm. They went and got a new wardrobe 
right? They and all of a sudden they were like, "How are they dress in Compton? I'm going to dress that way right here in the suburb of Spokane, Washington, because that because they the poetry hit them in a way that they ha- and, and you know it there's there's it's not it, it's not rocket science, right? The we're bad poets, they're good poets. <laughs> <laughs> they even if we have something better to say, which we do, uh, right. we we don't say it in a way that resonates with the humanity of our children, right? Um, so we've got this English speaking the the conversation of the English speaking people is what our children are all in, and we're not setting them up to be leaders of the conversation, the um, because we don't give them the we don't. First of all, we don't tell them that they're in a conversation, historically speaking, and then we don't give them the tools that they need to be leaders in that conversation. Um, and Chaucer, Chaucer, Shakespeare, you know, Milton are a major part of that conversation, that, and they're getting dropped, left out. And so I know you got to run, too, because we, we got a short time today, which is probably good for us. But I, I don't want to miss this. This is kind of for me connecting my kids to the English language is a way to anchor them in the covenantal story that is going on through time so that they will be able to be a part of, uh, how, how, how would you say this? Be a part of the, the narrative or the blessing to replant society the way it should go or so what God says is one of the people groups that he plans on st- having stand before his throne throughout eternity is English speakers, right? In- and so we have been told every language group is, is a, a, an identity group that God is going to pull in front of his throne. Yeah. Right. And so the, um, the, so there's a promise to English speakers, right? Just the same promise that there is to every group, but there's a promise to them. Right? So, so that we can expect that the English language is being prepped for an eternal choir mm. concert, mm. Right? an eternal poetry recitation, an eternal, uh, an eternal storytelling. You know, that, that's the, that's what language, the English language is being prepped for. And that the conversation that happens between now and the the return of Christ is that preparation, right, for that thing. So as a people group, um, we need people that lead the conversation towards the throne, right, towards that moment before the throne or that eternal moment before the throne, um, and that the um, and giving our children the kind of education in which they can lead that the conversation of the English speaking people in the right direction is the difference between prepping them to be the head versus prepping them to be the tail. Right. And we want to prep our children to be the head, not the tail, because God promises that that's the direction that our descendants are headed. They're headed towards the being the head and not the tail. So, um, but that's of everything, including English speaking, English speakers. Right. So um, now at this moment, it also is an enormous group of people. Right. So the English has spread far and wide. And so but that just makes it a fun conversation. Right. You can read Chino Achebe writing in English on the African continent um, or Joseph Conrad writing in English on the African continent and get a whole different perspective on the English language, um, for, because it, it's on a different soil, it's grown up in a different place, and and as, there's a lot of wisdom to be learned. Um, but that's a part of the the conversation that we're in, and um, and the poets are the ones that teach us how the language works. Right, like the the opening to the prologue. This is the version of Chaucer that I really like. Is the uh, Oxford World's Classics. I, I like this particular translation. Um, uh, but the first set of lines is when the sweet showers of April have pierced the drought of March, 
and pierced it to the root, and every vein is bathed in that moisture whose quickening force will engender the flower. And when the west wind, too, with its sweet breath, has given life in every wood and field to tender shoots, and when the stripling sun has run his half-course in Aries, the ram, and when the small birds are making melodies that sleep all the night long with open eyes, nature so prompts them and encourages, then people long to go on pilgrimages. Right? So that's just the opening lines. And already we've, we ha- we've learned uh, an enormous amount about the way Chaucer is setting us up to think. Right? So he, we're in the spring, right? The sweet showers of April are overcoming March. And also uh, the sun is run its half course in Aries. So that's has to do with what constellation the sun rises in. Right. So we know it's spring. It's it's uh, and but he also tells us and what happens in spring? Well, he's got all of this uh, really wonderful, earthy sexual imagery. Right. And if you've been around teenagers enough, you know that spring does funny things to the hormones of people as well. But it also, he says, the whole life is actually brought, the, the whole world is brought back to life, is resurrected in the spring um, because it's given this, this it's, it's imbued with this whole new set of desires. Um, so the sweet showers of April have pierced the drought of March and pierced it to the root and every vein is bathed in that moisture, right? got this piercing of the wetness of the world that spring (laughs) brings about, uh, whose quickening force will impregnate the flower. Right. So, but it's a quick, it's a life bringing force. This PG, what is is going on here? It is not right. It's not, but it's poetry. Right. So he hides it all (laughs) in plain sight. So he doesn't just come out. It's not pornographic, but it's, it's embracing the way that the world uh, that there's this rebirth that happens. And in order to get to a rebirth, in order to get to birth, you have to first have the, the union right, that's brought about, right? He says, and that happens every spring in the whole world. And he says, and then the West wind too, with its sweet breath has given life in every wood and field to tender shoots, right? He says the wind comes and blows up and down the back of the woods, the the back of the neck of the woods and you know and new life comes and and then he says the the small birds are making melodies that sleep all night long with open eyes nature so prompts them encourages right like the birds are singing marvin gay to their wives and they fill all the nests with new eggs the the fields fill up with new little pink mice you know the, everything gets pregnant everything makes love everything is excited is to be all over again it, it is right and because it's spring right and he says the whole world is imbued with this desire for new life this the the uh this this desire that shows up just in the in the recognition of one another's beauty right the the birds the, the male birds look around and they see their wives and they're like Let's make some eggs, baby. Right. Right, <laughs> right, right. And he said, and he says, but what happens though? He, then he, and he says, nature so prompts them and encourages and people long to go on pilgrimages. Right. So he says that whole desire uh, of, for new life that you see every spring when nature starts to wake back up, nature starts to be to, to the rebirth of spring happens. He said, what Does that, what does that, uh, correspond to in mankind? It's our desire to worship God, right? The, where is the, where is the real central rebirth that all of that is pictured pointing to? What is this poem of spring about? It's about the fact that God brings new life to his people every time they come before him, right? Mm. So Every Sunday is a new spring, right? A new spring in our lives, right? And, and our desire for new life is is fulfilled before the face of God, right? So it, it's this fully integrated understanding of the world as a poetic unity 
that we don't have anymore. Right, that I read that, that and I did not get that from that. I'm just gonna let you. Yeah, I read I mean, that. I've, I've I really read it did. a lot of times since so that's what it. That's, I only read that's it what once. It takes. Yeah. So, um, but worship but the, <laughs> this fully integrated understanding of of the world and history as God's poem that is that all of it it points to Jesus, right? That, I mean, that's First Corinthians. I mean, uh, Colossians one five through. Uh, Colossians 1, 15 through 20, that all of this place is created for Christ, through Christ, and to Christ, right? That there's a poetic, there's a fundamental poetic integrated unity in the world and in history that is all about Jesus. That understanding is what Chaucer brings and writes, but then his characters all tell different stories that either show that that is true or show that it's show that it's more true or show that it's less true, right? And that go against it or go for it. But that he, but he, he starts off by saying it's a, it's a storytelling contest, right? For who it is that best represents reality in the most beautiful way that most beautifully demonstrates, uh, this particular reality, right? So it, um, the in in the Middle English, he says that it has the the best sententia and salas, which uh, it has the most uh, clearly true, um, morally true or morally encouraging or most in line with reality. It's the the uh, and it and is the most enjoyable, the most beautiful story. Whoever does those two things the best tells the most encouraging the the story that best encourages the embrace of true morality and the story that is most enjoyable wins the storytelling contest, right? Because that is the history of all of reality, right? That's the history of, and he's quoting Horace, but then Shakespeare ends up quoting him at the end of Hamlet, right? So um, Horace and Chaucer both at the end of Hamlet. So because it's a long conversation about how do we best tell stories, uh, write poems, make music that reflects reality and shows how beautiful it is that describes reality and shows how beautiful it is. And, and that's the history of English literature, but we've decided to eject ourselves and our kids from the conversation. We haven't, we have been ejected. And so we don't realize we're ejecting our kids most of the time. Um, so we, we're trying to play re-entry, <laughs> a re-entry game, um, which can be a lot of fun. It can be frustrating as well, though, because you start realizing I didn't get an education. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. No, I'm laughing at me because that's sure? I'm laughing at the way I felt when I when I started when I realized you know I didn't get an education, and so I I look, you know, start, I just got the list from the, um, five foot shelf of books and started reading them. And you realize I just, there just wasn't an education offered, right? It was available. It was just at the library. It, it wasn't <laughs> offered at my school. <laughs> All right. So now I got to put Chaucer in my list, but he's fun, right? That's the other thing is reading yeah, Chaucer is. is a lot of fun. He is not. I, I did enjoy it. it. Was he was an easy read for me, uh, but the the width and the breadth of his writing, just listening to you go through that is something that I haven't begun to exercise yet. Like the the correlation between his writing, I'm just trying to understand it first. Like I'm in the grammatical stage of it, just trying to understand yeah. it. You're already at the poetic stage of it, like <laughs> you know. But and, the, but it's 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 stories, right? And so sometimes somebody starts telling a story. And you're like, wait, this is, is this a dirty story? And you're like, it is, this guy's telling a dirty story. And then right. the, the group pot stops him. It's like, okay, come on, come on. Right. And then they get into a, they start telling stories about women and there's, you've got guys that hate women. You've got guys that think women are wonderful and you've got women telling stories about women, men telling stories about women. And, and they get into this contest about who can tell the best story about women. And then they tell stories about marriage and then they tell story, you know, it's stories about the church. And it's really quite a, it's quite a feat. Um, but it's also just a lot of fun. I mean, 
they're just stories. They're good stories. And then Jeffrey Chaucer is one of the characters in this there. And it, when it comes to his turn, he tells the m- most terrible banal story <laughs> and they stop him because it's so bad. Right. It's funny. It's like, you know, it's, a, he, it's like, and then Jeffrey Chaucer has to step up and tell a story and it's awful. And it, it's, you know, he's just trying to be, he's trying to entertain, but entertain from a particular understanding, particular worldview in which he knows that it's his job to uplift because Ephesians tells us that's our job to edify and uplift uh, our hearer, but he has to, but it has to, but you do that by truly and beautifully putting reality on display and not everything about a real story is going to be edifying in when taken as a snapshot. Um, it, but it went, but when you put it into its, the non edifying parts into its proper place in the story, then the yeah. story as a whole can be edifying. And so that's what he's trying to accomplish. Uh, and, and what Which we don't funny. do as Christians, storytellers, no, especially. No, we'll, we'll pure flicks it because we can't have those things be a part of the story. Right. Right. Because we don't actually tell the story where good guys are good and bad guys are bad. What we do is create some soft version of each one of them. Right. Right. And yeah. So anyway, you, I know you got to run. So, but okay. <laughs> we might have to do, we might have to do this again. We might have to do Chaucer again because I don't think we're done. Or maybe, yeah, maybe talk some more about Chaucer and then get to the Burke yeah, uh, that, connection. Yeah. 